Welcome to Beamstream. Um, this is Coda Sprint episode five, I believe, of the podcast. And today we're joined with Chris. Um, so say hi, Chris, and um, a short introduction about yourself. Hi, uh, my name's Chris. Um, I'm a software developer on Twitch, and I make all sorts of fun projects that kind of just showcase the process of software development and how an idea becomes an actual, like, you know, application that you uh, it's one of my favorite things to just have an idea and build something from it. Nice, short and sweet. I love that. So um, I guess just starting off right from the beginning um, before to where you are right now, um, what was your sort of first steps into development? And uh, did you learn professionally right off the bat? Or where were you before this? <laughs> So I think it's tough because I, I'm old, I'm like 38. So I'm from the generation where we had GeoCities, MySpace, like all these tools trained us on very specific technologies because they didn't have the technology to do any better. So GeoCities, have at it, do some HTML. MySpace, learn some CSS. And all of a sudden, just by using social media, I had gotten a little bit of HTML stuff. There was some stuff in high school, I had done a little bit of like flash action scripting in some high school classes. But for the most part, I didn't actually become a programmer until 10 years after high school. So I didn't have great grades in high school because I was a bit of a slacker. And because of that, I decided I just wanted to be a snowboard bum. And I actually went and snowboarded 200 plus days a year for like 10 years straight. And ended up getting free gear and all that. And then after that, I decided, well, okay, can't snowboard forever. Knees are a finite resource. So instead, I decided that I should probably like figure out what I want to do. And my parents are both computer programmers. Uh, my mom has a degree in mathematics, and I don't even remember if my dad actually graduated like from college. But the main thing is that they're still they're developers, and they've done some amazing things throughout their career. And they were very supportive of me being a snowboard bum because they also, you know, they enjoyed their time. They're con they were contractors most of uh, my growing up, and you know. They just could make the money they wanted to and do what they wanted, move where they wanted, where the jobs would be, whatever. And it's, yeah, really cool seeing that power and having parents that were supportive to say, like, yeah, you can be a software developer anytime. You don't have to rush into it. So I got really lucky having parents like that. Right. So then, yes, continuing along, after the 10 years, um, I started doing some WordPress sites for friends, Magento sites for friends, and then went and got a two-year community college degree uh, in applied science. Okay, that's that is a lot to take in, actually. And yeah, it's like very it's a different. long story. Yeah. yeah, no worries. Um, I mean, I guess starting off from your snowboarding experience, um, did you want to go professionally, um, in that sport or? I thought so, uh, when I was starting out, but as you start going, like you can get to certain like levels, and I never got a paycheck, but I did get free gear, and that was really all I needed. I just wanted the recognition. And it gets to the point where, like, yeah, uh, depending on the snowboarders, you kind of just have to snowboard because you're getting that paycheck sometimes, right? You can't just be like, eh, nah, that could hurt. I don't want to do that, right? Sometimes you just have to perform. And I don't know. I never wanted to feel obligated to snowboard. Oh, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's fair enough. I guess physical limitations as time goes on is a thing, so... Um, but in terms of, uh, I, I guess you mentioned your parents, um, did you already have a sort of fallback in the back of your mind since your parents are developers? So the only logical thing is if nothing works out, you would become a, de a developer as well. Was it like yeah, that? I mean, or? So, so I've always just been kind of tech savvy, you know, like built my first PC in high school, you know, barely programming, you know, this is a long time ago. And I don't know, I've just always been pretty much the one of my siblings and brothers that was more like tech focused. So I just, I don't know, I think I was always kind of like pushing myself towards this path without even. Uh, I see. So it wasn't like a complete, you know, shock, um, you know, going into writing code, for example, when you've done, you know, building PCs and whatnot. Or... Yeah, I mean... 
software dev is remarkably simple and easy compared to waiting tables, bartending. Oh, <laughs> those are nightmares. I've done them and I didn't like it, <laughs> you know? Right. So I just, yeah. I knew that that wasn't something I wanted to do. And I, I've always had at least the pragmatic approach of it has to be something that's going to pay well enough that I'm okay doing it a lot too. Even if it's, you know, something I enjoy, it still needs to pay enough to get that like base level of satisfaction. And software development really just seemed like it. Yeah. In terms of your education, so you mentioned going back to community college um, to get a formal qualification. Um, did you feel it was actually, you know, necessary uh, where you are in your industry at that time to succeed? Or um, At the time, I don't think I felt it necessary after doing it. There are definitely classes and things that I would not have taught myself. I would not have learned myself. And I also was privileged enough to have grandparents that when I was born, they set money aside into a, some fund that I was able to use strictly for college. I couldn't use it for anything else, but I did have a leg up. Oh, cool, cool. So I guess it was just sort of, you know, they can't <laughs> question you um, about your formal qualifications after that, right? It's just a bit safer to do or... So, I mean, the community college two-year degree isn't a bachelor's degree, it's an associate's degree, which means that it's really just very small compared to what most human resources departments and hiring managers are looking for when they look for a college degree. So I don't have nearly as much computer science, like, qualifications. I don't, I can't read binary, I don't care what <laughs> computers are for, you know? Yeah. I can't read hexadecimal, I don't care, that's what computers are for, you know? So yeah. Things like that. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so I guess moving on from your um, formal education, now you mentioned creating some Magento sites and WordPress sites. Um, mm. Take us through your professional uh, background and where you started with as a developer and um, where you are right now, I guess. Okay. Um, so I've, I've dabbled with it for a long time. So I had a GeoCity site, right? Did some Flash websites for a friend, but that, you know, didn't make any money off it. And then eventually, uh, through snowboarding, I had a friend that owned a snowboard shop. And they at least wanted a blog. So we set a blog up for them. And then after a while, they realized that they could start selling gear. And we, tr we set up a Magento site. It turns out that they didn't actually want to run an online store. Because they were not set up or capable of doing, like, warehousing and shipping when an order comes in. But they managed to sell snowboards to someone in North Carolina during the summer, you know, like it's just, they could have made so much money off of it, but it's just an effort thing that they had other business endeavors they were doing too. Ooh. So it kind of made sense. Um, a lot of the Magento sites I've made are no longer even because <laughs> a lot of the businesses have pivoted. So um, one of them was a, a clothing uh, company where like screen printing and shirts, and I've got some of their shirts and beanies and stuff. And, uh, yeah, they started out having like an online store, but really they're a screen printing shop. So they're just, their main business model now is just printing other people's stuff, not being a brand. So yeah, a lot of the, the stuff I've done is, you know, just not even out there in those. Rooms. Not a big deal. And um, how long have you worked like that for um, till you kind of broke out of that area? So I probably did my first like WordPress site like 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. And I didn't finish my two year degree till about 2012. And that's, yeah, not two years, right? It's because I was doing spring and fall and then snowboarding during uh, winter and summer. And still like, you know, snowboarding during spring too. But uh, yeah, so I kind of like went slow doing my degree. But basically, I don't know, four or five years of being a bad freelancer before <laughs> I got my first like job. Cool. But I do want to say that freelance experience helped me get my first job because I had experience going through the product life cycle with a client, and I ended up getting my first job at a client agency where that's what they did. So it was nice having that experience, being able to jump into client. And I guess as a freelancer, was it quite hard to kind of uh, do it at first? Because like you said... Oh, freelancing is a nightmare. Oh, You're right, not okay. just a software developer as a freelancer. You are sales, CEO, CFO, right? Accounting, like you're every hat of a business. And I, I'm really bad with some of those hats. 
Right. Yeah. So it's essentially like running a one man business, right? At mm -hmm. that point. Right. Yeah. Everything hinges on your efforts. And if you're not good at marketing or sales, you're not going to get new clients. And yeah, it's a bad situation. Ooh. So I, I recommend freelancing on a small scale for people, but I don't recommend making it something you do in perpetuity until you've actually gotten greater experience in the industry. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people aren't going to be good at ironing out a contract, right? Setting some of those stipulations. So if you go work at a client agency first, you can actually see some of the behind the scenes stuff that makes them successful. Cool. Um, I guess, so you mentioned a lot about freelance, but have you gone into more full-time work uh, at all? Or, or oh yeah, have you so been... I don't freelance anymore at all. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Yeah, so, no, so yeah. I started working at a client agency, which is a full-time gig, and they go out and do the sales and get clients, and I just work on the project. So that's what I did for a good five years. Ended up working at another company for a little over a year uh, after that, and then decided that I'd rather just stream for at least a year. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm enjoying it. So let's actually get into that part, right? So I guess alongside your full time you are also doing live streams on twitch is that correct i'm not full time anymore. okay so i'm taking time off i saved up some money i decided mm -hmm. i just wanted to stream and work on some of my own stuff because i think anyone who works on others other people's stuff for long enough sees that it's not that hard you come up with an idea iron out a monetization strategy and you make it so i'm i wanted to try and do some of that myself not freelancing but actually like startup so I'm doing a couple projects like that, and I hope to launch them soon. But. That is awesome. I didn't know you went out of your full-time to full-time um, stream as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. I guess take us through the first time you streamed, and were you also live streaming while having a full-time? Or... Uh, so... When I started streaming, basically, I was no longer full-time at the client in agency. I had become a contractor, which meant that they could throw hours my way. I could work up to 80 a week if I wanted. I didn't want to. But I was hourly, so it meant that I could at least get my checks and do whatever. But as a contractor, they can't stipulate when you work, which is also nice. Like They can say, make it to the meetings and things like that, but they can't say what hours you get your work done. So it was very freeing to just stream whenever I wanted and get my work done outside of stream. Ooh. So yeah, that was pretty fun. Um, my first stream, I didn't really know how any of, the, any of it was going to go. I, yeah, it was just, I don't know, let's try it. And it, yeah, it worked out pretty fun. I liked it. And how long have you been streaming uh, uh, up to uh, now? I hit four years in June, so uh, four years and a couple months. Right. And yeah, it's really fun. I just hit partner uh, like a couple weeks ago. Oh, wow. Congrats. Congrats on that. Yeah, That's amazing. You. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess this builds into, you know, the whole Twitch career in such a, it's quite a niche category in Twitch, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I guess um, my question to you, but as also a live streamer, very, very small live streamer as well, um, how was it? Um, how was it in terms of community building while also keeping focus on what you're working on, right? Because as a developer, your brain is constantly ticking, but at the same time, you want to entertain viewers as well, right? Uh, I don't know. I think I actually set myself up for like productive streaming, basically, because I've always had like a movie on in the background or TV going or something. So my my attention's always like somewhat distracted and streaming is the same thing. You know, you hammer something out and then, Hey, how's it going? Everyone, blah, blah, you know, chat, say hi. And I don't know. Uh, it seems like the way I've always kind of coded just lended itself towards stream. Um, I've even done that in interviews where I'm just like chatting with the person interviewing me, doing the coding problem. And then, you know, Oh, let's try and run it. Got an error, fix it. And then boom, the whole thing's fixed. And they're like, wait, what? Because they thought I was just chatting the whole time, you know? Wow, that is, that's like, it's a real boss move right there. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of fun. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, 
But I do also want to say that streaming in the software and game dev category is awesome. It's such a good community. All the streamers just know each other and support each other, and the raids are just always going to each other. You don't see that in many, like, gaming communities. You'll see it in, like, art stream communities and cooking and things. But games? Ooh, people are very territorial about it. It's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess because it's a niche sort of category within Twitch, have you noticed any of the more common controversies with other categories, uh, you know, bigger categories than uh, um, development? So what do you mean by controversies? Like, you know, as you said, they're very um, territorial <laughs> when it comes to viewership right. and stuff like that, whereas, you know, if we're not afraid as live streamers to share our code, then we're going to be quite open about, you know, um, sharing viewers and whatnot, right? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I just think the viewers in the software and game dev category are, like, very passionate about wanting to watch more software and game dev. So it's, it's very rare to actually raid someone outside of the category. And I think that's really nice to see some of the bigger streamers like the Primogen and Bash Bunny actually doing because it introduces our smaller niche community to broader communities. I just think it's better when it's the big people in our category doing it because it lets them know that we're actually like, you know, we're legit. So it's very interesting. Um, I, I haven't seen much uh, territorialness, but we do get a lot of it is somewhat territorial about like tech and you'll get people who just will hate on whatever tools you use and they're going to segment themselves into some sub community because they just need to feel better than other people. And it's gross. And that's actually the thing I hate the most about the software and game dev uh, categories. Interesting. People use a tool and they treat it like their favorite toy and it's the only thing they'll ever use. Again, right. And it's just, ugh. yeah, it's interesting. Very narrow mindset. Yeah, I mean, especially as a developer, right? Like, we know technology is, is growing so quickly, week on mm -hmm. week, right? It's only, well, I, I say it should be normal to kind of be open to technologies, but yeah, I, I guess as the expertise is increased in, a, in an individual, you tend to be a bit more opinionated, right? Um, I don't think so. I think you can become an expert with all sorts of stuff and it'll actually open up that they all do the same thing. Right? All, <laughs> yeah, like frameworks, right? <laughs> yeah, all the JS frameworks just throw HTML into a DOM and that's it. That's all they're doing. It's just JavaScript and HTML. Like, yeah. The way they do it is actually not that much different either. Like the syntax differs, but the way they're actually updating and rationalizing changes to the DOM, that's just the component life cycle. Hooks have just kind of changed like the words we use to describe them. That's it. So like all of this stuff just uses the same abstraction. Actually, funny you say that a lot of this stuff is mostly the same. Uh, whenever I join your live streams, you're always doing something, you know, completely out of my depth. Um, categories of programming that i wouldn't ever touch but you're just not afraid to just learn with the viewers right yeah, yeah i mean what's what's the worst that could happen you make a program that doesn't run i do that with languages i know so i don't really <laughs> care like it doesn't matter <laughs> yeah um i mean having said that though how many technologies have you touched because it seems quite diverse really ah, i mess with everything um like i said i started dev with WordPress back in 2008, back then we didn't have any of these fancy frameworks. Like Angular JS just started at Google in 2008, you know, <laughs> things like that. And I've seen all of them kind of like grow and come and go and trying to like pick one as a favorite toy is just wrong because I have, I've seen it happen where like Ember was hundred plus people going to the Seattle meetup. It was amazing. Like once a month, hundred plus people going to the Ember meetup. And just a year or two later, there's 10 people at the meetup, right? Because React came out and, you know, hype-driven development, right? So it's just <laughs> yeah. very interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting that you mention Ember because my company is using Ember as well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, even it's today. it's fine as long as you keep it updated, right? If yep. you're staying on an old version, you're going to have some problems, you know? But that's the same with everything, Yeah, you know? I guess a controversial question possibly is, what is your current favorite um, JavaScript I don't framework? Favorites. 
I'm sorry. I okay, don't. fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> but if yeah, you had not to, sports teams. I don't have a favorite hammer as yeah. a carpenter. You know, like, yeah. I don't have a favorite wrench. I use the wrench that does the job. So I guess moving on from uh, all of the technologies in your breadth of knowledge, um, in terms of actually leveraging these technologies, what are you currently working on as part of your projects? Um, um, so currently I've been using a thing called Architect, which is a wrapper around AWS Lambda, API Gateway. I'm sure it's using the, um, the, the CDK or whatever from Amazon. And it's pretty cool. Like I can just write my Lambda functions, use a, a metadata file to generate them, create new ones, things like that. And I can just deploy it with one command. And it's just up there on Lambda grouped together. I am permission scoped to each thing. It's a really cool framework. And I haven't seen anything else that does some of the features that it has. So I've been able to just, I can set up a cron job, an SMS queue, like all sorts of stuff within Amazon without actually even having to know anything about Amazon. Right? So it's really nice. Oh, that is really cool. It's funny you mention Lambdas because I've literally advocated for Lambdas in my company and just about starting that up right now. And I guess one of the biggest issues I've had is dealing with IAM permissions and mm. all of that horribleness um uh, yeah if you want to check yeah. it out it's arc.code so arc.codes and yeah some of the like why architect things are really awesome like each lambda has its own specific im permission right Ooh. It's yeah really nice um and i so that project you're creating a wrapper around arc or i have a wrapper around arc as well that's called kalatrava but that's okay. basically just some of the boilerplate that I would need for mm -hmm. launching a new application as quick as possible. And that means I've got my own DynamoDB wrapper for querying like a, a single table data structure. Um, I've got uh, like a bunch of middleware for verifying tokens and things like that. The login and register endpoints get scaffolded. Like I just have a bunch of boilerplate that I can hammer out for myself. And then, you know, everything else is business specific for the application I need after rather than just the boilerplate. Cool. And I guess in terms of actually, you know, releasing this product uh, that you're working on to consumers, um, I guess you have run a business before because of freelance and whatnot. Um, do you think you'll use all of those skills learned um, to market your project? Or are you thinking yeah. completely so, different? Hold on. Let me just point out, I may have misspoke. So Architect is one of the tools I'm using to build actual more like consumer facing products. I'm not necessarily okay. building Calatrava for anyone else. It's more just so that I can launch products myself. So some of the products I'm making then are ones like a meal deciding app. It's like Tinder for food, but it's not necessarily like one person just swiping through all the stuff in their area like Tinder. It's instead, how do we de like figure out consensus among a group of people? So if, you know, if you're the meal provider of your family, the mom, dad, whatever, and you do the cooking or the shopping or just at least going out to grab the takeout, how many, how many hours per month do you probably spend just going around asking people what they want to eat today? If you've ever done it over a group text message, that's a nightmare, isn't it? So like we could solve that group consensus idea of like what we eat in a really simple way. And I'm going to do that. I'm doing that as a React Native app. And that's pretty much it. But Architect is the thing doing my back end. Oh, okay, right, right. So Architect essentially makes it very easy to create groups of abstraction um, for you to build applications on. Is that pretty much it? Or Yeah, well, I'm going to need like a REST API for mm -hmm. anything I make, basically, right? Yeah. So I need to be able to scaffold that up as quick as possible. And I, I just don't want to write all of my middleware new every time so I, i'm just trying to make sure that i can streamline like the brand new project for us rather than just sit there i mean it's the same reason you would use like a cli tool for dev mm -hmm. you don't want to sit there having to set up your webpack from scratch every time. it's just ugh, or v or whatever right instead you can just use a cli tool that sets all of it up for you with sensible defaults and you can be up and running making some so and that's the main reason I, I really like Architect and my rapper color Trapper. Right, I see, I see. Um, in I guess, uh, so So you're live streaming this whole journey then? Um, back to oh, yeah, fun? Yeah. 
Cool. Yeah, I don't uh, I don't do any coding on this stuff off stream. I have done a little bit of like the business administration and maybe some like copywriting because mm -hmm. copywriting is pretty. Uh, uh, yeah, for the most part, all coding happens on stream. And um, is your solutions currently also open source for the public to see? Or? Um, not open source. So they can see the code as I'm making it, but there's no repo uh, that they could browse. OK, right, right. Yep, that's completely fair. I mean, I guess yeah. that turns into IP issues, right, um, if it's open. Yeah, I mean, so you, even if it's open source, you can have a proprietary license on it. So you can yeah. release copyrighted code to GitHub, and someone using it is liable to, for a lawsuit, theoretically. Yeah. But I just don't even feel like dealing with that. <laughs> because enough. I don't think the source code for it matters that much. It's, you know, it's just create, read, update, delete, technically. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, moving on from Twitch. Uh, so let's say you've basically built your project and um, it's ready to, to go out to people um, or the clients that you are targeting. Um, if that sort of makes it, um, will you continue to live stream? Or because I foresee oh, yeah. many business, you know, things coming up all the time, right? <laughs> Um, so I think it depends. I don't, I don't really think that me election is what I'm calling the, the food app. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to have any, any major business decisions that would prevent me from streaming. I think it's more, do I enjoy streaming? Yeah. It's my favorite thing to do besides snowboarding. So I'm going to keep doing it. Maybe less hours, but I don't know. We'll see. Cool. And um... I do stream about 40 hours a week. Yeah, that's practically a full-time job now, isn't it? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, uh, it, well, it's really interesting in the live streaming space because, you know, the question of sustainability comes up. And at your current viewership, are you, you don't have to answer any financials. Don't, I won't dig into your understand. financials. Um, but I just wanted to ask, are you able to essentially sustain yourself? As your no, okay. So it's that simple. I saved up money to be able to just stream as I'm streaming. Ah, uh, okay, right, cool. Right, but you know, it's definitely nice. Like the stream really does offer support, and it's paid for so much of my stream equipment. Right, mm -hmm. to like upgrade and you know get a better PC, etc. I make about six thousand dollars a year, which is awesome as a streamer. It's basically like I'd be streaming anyway, so it's just a bonus. But it's definitely not something I can live on. I see, I see, yeah. That's a pretty grounded approach because obviously some live streamers have the impression of, you know, wanting to do it purely one man sustainability, you know, which is yeah. very challenging these days, isn't mm -hmm. it? Um, yeah. But I, I guess, are you striving for that kind of thing? Especially because I know you love live streaming and yeah, yeah. Look, yeah. So to make it like fully sustainable, I, I need to do the YouTube thing. I'm slacking on that. Um, yeah, or I'd have to, you know, 10 times my numbers. Mm -hmm. That would do it too. So that would be tough, but doable. I just think uh, it's more likely that branching out to other like uh, avenues such as YouTube would probably be a better way. Like, you know, increasing the revenue. Yep. Because, that's yeah, at... $500 a month, that's about 200 something subs, which is really cool. But yeah, we'd have to get up to like 2000 subs to actually pay. Right? I see. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's pretty hard to reach. But you know, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess in terms of, you know, the, the Twitch community and uh, well, I was going to go into collaborations. Um, have you ever collabed with anyone as part of the community or is it just sort Not of raiding? Really. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I'm okay with it. I think you run into interesting like intellectual property issues of uh, okay. who owns the thing and blah, blah, blah. And if it's something that could make money, then I don't know. I, it's, it's tough. I don't want to burn any bridges that way unless it's a, an established, like we're going to make a business out of this thing. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So I don't know. I think that's trickier. But as far as collaborations, I wouldn't mind 
doing some you know talk show style things kind of like this with other streamers uh i don't think i can say too much about it but twitch is working on something that will allow like you to bring other people onto your stream which is pretty cool yeah. like any other twitch viewer you could just bring right on which is interesting yeah i, I guess it's funny you mentioned um you know a lot of people coming into twitch and giving the tools for them to do that um what do you think is essentially holding back the developer live stream community from getting bigger? Is there something holding us back, do you think? Or um, I think just more variety of content. And that's where that's where like the primogen is pushing the envelope, right? He is entertaining. He's got YouTube videos that are just entertaining and to the point. He's bringing people from all sorts of other platforms via his like front end masters courses, like all sorts of stuff. He is probably growing the category more than most. And it's really cool. Besides maybe uh, learn with Leon. Yeah. Uh, do you know Leon Noel? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, those two guys are really doing the biggest thing for the communities, introducing people from outside areas into Twitch. And that's really cool. I think the biggest thing is just Twitch itself as like the software and game dev category is really just like one or 2000 viewers on average mm -hmm. at any time of the day until yeah. you get people like the prime and Jenner Leon that are bumping that up, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I guess speaking about platforms, uh, you said that Twitch, uh, I mean, YouTube might be a better avenue for, you know, sustainability, but Not as necessarily a better, Sorry, right. I want to phrase it as more like getting multiple revenue streams is just ah, better, okay. right? Yeah. Because you don't have to 10x, you can just 4x on those and get the same value from them and, you know, you're getting some good good value, right? So instead of having to 10x your growth on one platform, you can have your growth kind of like parallelized on multiple. Mm -hmm. Sorry, didn't I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to make sure that was like out there. <laughs> Yeah, no worries, no worries at all. Um, so I, I guess in terms of like platforms itself, um, there are a few technological edges that YouTube provides, which I feel is sometimes better, like for developer live streams. Like for example, when you live stream on YouTube, you can actually, or people can actually seek back um from your live stream right even though it's live and i feel like that's one of its key feature especially when you're doing like a really educational tutorial based live stream right um right. do I you think, think technically yeah. you can do that on twitch though if the user oh, has okay. mods enabled you can just go into their videos section and look at the one that's being broadcast right now and scrub back i did not know that <laughs> yep. Yep. That's but fair it's enough. not as intuitive. It's a couple extra clicks away, so the user experience of it is maybe lacking, right? I see. Yeah. Whereas I guess YouTube already provides that um, as you visit the stream, right? Pretty yep. much. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, Alrighty. I think we are pretty much going towards the end of the um, podcast. Um, cool. So what I like to do before the end of the stream is um, I'd like to ask you if you have any message to developers out there, possibly even potential developer live streamers out there, would you have a message for them in general? Um, if you're thinking about streaming, just do it. No big deal, right? You're going to have people in your audience that are smarter than you, some that aren't, some that know more about the thing you're doing, some that don't. The key is that we all start at the same place and we all learn stuff as we go. So there's nothing to lose by starting to do it. And it's really nice for accountability because you know, one thing that I can't do while I'm streaming, hop onto some video game, hop onto Twitter and just ignore my work for an hour. Right? So it's actually really good for accountability and making sure that you're, you know, just plugging away, putting the work in. Ooh. So yeah, I'd recommend it. If you're th looking into streaming, you should totally do it. It's really fun. Alrighty. Thank you, Chris. And that brings it to the end of the live stream. So thanks very much, Chris, for joining and really appreciate your time. Um, all of the links and socials of Chris will go um, in the description. So all good on that as well. Thanks for watching. <laughs> thanks. Have a great day.